that, that night at two o'clock in the morning after the reception in someone's room, I wrote down on a cocktail napkin the basic mingling techniques that ended up in the book. That is Jean Martinet, the author of The Art of Mingling, Fun and Proven Techniques for Mastering Any Room. Now, I have always been a pretty strong introvert, and I never enjoyed mingling uh, type events very much until I read this book 15 years ago. The book was eye-opening for me, and while I would not say that I'm good at mingling today, the techniques in this book at least help me survive and sometimes even enjoy myself. So it was a huge amount of fun to speak with Jean and discuss the advice in the book and how she came to write it. If you'd like to get better at mingling, I strongly, strongly recommend Jean's book. Hello, Jean. Welcome to the show. Hi, how are you? I am doing fantastic. And I got to say, I am so, so excited to speak with you, Jean, because (laughs) I, I, I mean, it's like, you know, for me speaking to, you know, I don't know, super role model, celebrity, because your book, The Art of Mingling, Fun and Proven Techniques for Mastering Any Room, has been so important to me in my life. I love your book. That's so so good to hear. That's really, I'm very happy about that. So um, I read it, I don't know, like what, 10 years ago, some some number of years ago. I mean, it feels like 10 or 15 years ago. And I I tell you, I used to be a total mingle phobe, as you would say. Mm-hmm. Um, and I really dreaded, um, I mean, I just did not like cocktail parties or whatever, because I'm a really strong I, you know, introvert MBTI. Um, but I learned some techniques in your book that made me a total mingo mingle file, if that's a thing. I mean, I'm, I totally am fine with it now. That's and good. By, by, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, let, you're a mingling expert now. Well, no, no, I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say I'm a mingling expert, but, <laughs> but a mingle file, well, I don't mind it. And I'm sometimes, right. sometimes even embrace it. And I, I would say I'm, I'm still very much an amateur, but I, I don't mind the situations as much. So um, I'm really psyched to talk about your book and about mingling lessons because uh, it's such a valuable life thing and, okay. you know, real business ROI on it too. So um, before we talk maybe about the content of the book, tell me a little bit about how in the world did you like, you know, decide to write a book on mingling? Like what led you to that point? Were you like an awesome mingler who said, you know, nobody else can do this right. Well, and I'm going to tell them or the, did... I was, it turns out I was an awesome mingler, but I didn't realize it until one fateful weekend in Ohio, I was at a wedding, um, of a college friend of mine and all of our college friends were there. But, you know, we didn't know anybody else at the wedding because we were, you know, we were, we had all flown to Dayton to go to this wedding. And at the end of the reception, my friends were all teasing me because they said they just talked to each other and they saw that I like mingled with the whole town. (laughs) And I didn't even realize that I had this, if not expertise, at least, um, you know, appetite for mingling with strangers that I, I suddenly started being aware of. And that night at two o'clock in the morning after the reception, in someone's room, I wrote down on a cocktail napkin the basic mingling techniques that ended up in the book. Th- th- that night, you just put it yeah, down. That night, I put it. it <laughs> cocktail napkins, by the way, are a great uh, way to start a book. <laughs> there, there's something about a cocktail napkin that is it's like less um, onerous than a blank piece of paper, you know, and it's like fun and you can throw it away and it's just it's like low pressure. I, I often start my books on cocktail napkins. Cocktail napkins should come with, with like ballpoint pens next to them. So you can do that. Um, Sorry, say that again. I said, ball, you know, cocktail napkins should all come with, uh, with ballpoint pens. So you yeah, can, right. you can do that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so, so let's, 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 let's kind of talk about the structure of the book. So you talk about, um, first of all, overcoming mingle phobia and some survival fantasies, uh, and, and how do you choose your first clique? And then you move into making a successful entrance, which is often one of the toughest things. How do you break into a little right. clique? And then some tools for continuing a conversation once you broke it in and the great escape. So th- those are kind of the first four, I'd say, um, uh, killer chapters for, for the basics. And then you move on to sort of fancy footwork and so forth. But let's, maybe we start with some of those. So, um, so talk to me about those first two, like the first two parts about um over like how do you break in how do you choose your first click and and some ways that you mm-hmm. suggest of breaking in 
Um, well, first of all, a lot of people um, don't know they get frozen with terror when they first enter a party. You know, they may not be totally prepared for how many people are there and how many people they don't know. So I do, as you said, have sections in the beginning on how to sort of save your panic, how to um, deal with that and that feeling. And some of them sound sort of silly, like one is called the buddy system, which is not about a real buddy, but it's about an imaginary friend. <laughs> so you pretend that your best friend uh, is over your right shoulder, you know, like as imagine if they were with you, like they'd be saying, oh, come on, we can do this. No big deal. Um, and th there are other ones like that. Um, then as far as, then you, you know, you put your coat away, say hello to the hostess or the host. And then of course you have to figure out what are you going to do next? And, um, there are a couple of things I recommend. One of them is to, um, when you're trying to figure out who to approach first, if you don't know anyone, um, you sort of try to, figure out, uh, read their body language. If you see a group of people that are really tightly together and they don't have any open, like there's no open breaks in their body, you know, their bodies are really like a tight circle, that's probably not a good place to start. Um, you probably will, if you keep looking around, you'll find a couple of people who are sort of talking but also looking around the room and sort of open to seeing what's going on, and those are the people that you should, like that's one example of, of how you pick, you know, a group to join. Yeah. And, 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 and we, we kind of skipped over a couple awesome survival fantasies, which, which are super helpful. So talk okay. to us about the naked room. The naked room, the naked room is so funny. Cause I think that it's probably, I'm sure that I probably read about this tech uh, technique in a, you know, a 1930s novel or something, but it's when you pretend that everyone is not naked, naked, that could be a little too upsetting for some people or, you know, distracting. <laughs> but I like to pretend that people are in their underwear and their socks. Because um, really, that makes them all very, very um, vulnerable. Less impressive, and, too. Yeah. Pardon? Less impressive. <laughs> and Less you know, it sort of can you know just but you know they it can take away some of your fear to to imagine everybody in the rooms naked. You know the the other another version of that which wasn't in the. Um, by the way, I don't know if you mentioned to your audience that, um, cause you said you'd read the book 10 years ago, but I did revise this book in 2015. I actually have so, that one in my hands right now. 2000, yeah. the new <laughs> anyway, and revised just, edition. Just to make sure that it's, uh, we have all the, you know, the latest, uh, tips in there, but, um, there's also, I, I wrote about it in another book because it's not in this book, but there's another one I really like we might as well just say, which is related to the naked room, which is that when you pretend that everybody in the room is four years old, if people are really terrifying you, that's a really good psychological trick too. But anyway, in the book, there's also a, a um, technique called the invisible man. Um, and the invisible man is when you pretend that no one can see you. Um, and that's really pretty in interesting thing to do because it's based on the, the, the rule that um, no one's really thinking about you. You feel very self-conscious. You think like, oh my God, people are going to see me standing alone in the room. But the fact is that people do not... They're just involved in their own fears or fun that they're having. And so if you pretend that you're the invisible man from the old movie and that no one, you've got a magic thing on you so that no one can see you, that allows you to kind of just mosey along the room, maybe go have a nibble at the buffet and just sort of not worry about it and you'll end up exuding an air of confidence. That you don't do that for too long. You can't stay invisible. For too long, you must <laughs> re-enter <laughs> reality. You don't want to become a party ghost. And one of the tips, which is maybe implicit in the book, is that treating the whole thing as a game also really helps. At least that's what that that's what helps me. Like so, as if if you kind of go to this thing, okay, now I actually have to talk to people. I don't know what to say, um, and it's just Will Bachman. It's me here. Uh, it makes it super hard. But if you yeah. say, okay, now I'm going to start using some of these techniques that I learned from the art of mingling, then it's like, okay, I'm going to try to break into that clique there. So let, let's get into that. What are some ways to break in? Because that's so hard to, you know, yeah. you know, but I love it. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, that's sort of the, the crux of it. Um, the two major things that people always want to talk about is how to get into a conversation and, and how to get out, which <laughs> right. we get, we'll get into later. But um, it's true that, that, that I... One of the things that I um, coach people about is to, if you have any goals about the party, you should let them go because your goal, your first goal has to be to have fun. Like, so, you know, if you are there because you want to meet people for your business or you're really hoping to, you know, um, find a, a relationship 
romantic relationship, you have to put those in the back of your mind because your first and foremost, you know, goal should be to have fun connecting with the people in this room. And as you say, it is like a game. It should be like a fun thing. Like when I walk into a room, I, I see it as a big, um, smorgasbord, like a big buffet of food. Like all the people are like <laughs> things that I want to taste anyway. Um, so the four entrance techniques that I, the four basic ones that I use, there could be variations on these, um, are number one, something I call the honest approach. The honest approach is really, uh, remarkable for its sincerity. It's not, you know, it doesn't have to be totally honest, but it is a sincere approach in which you go up to a group of people and you say, hi, my name is Will. I don't know a single soul at this party. And when you throw yourself on the mercy of people like that, it's at first it feels scary, like you're stepping into thin air, but you will find that most people will respond incredibly well to that because they are charmed and disarmed by your through giving giving your power over sort of like that way, and it basically you know and anybody who's not an it and a jerk will then introduce you to everyone in that group and probably other people as well if they know them so it's just a great way to start because you don't have to you know you don't have to pose as anything else when when does that one when does that one when you would do, when you would avoid against that one you can't do it if you really know a lot of people at the party <laughs> okay. you can't like it's the honest <laughs> approach you could probably get away with it if you know one or two people at the party and you can say i don't know anybody here because it's more or less true but to use the honest approach it has to actually be mostly true <laughs> that you don't know anyone because if somebody else hears you saying it and they've just heard you <laughs> saying it at the group before you know <laughs> you're, you're you're in some trouble All right. um but it's a great one to use at the beginning you know yeah. when you haven't met anybody yet because it you know it, it gets you right in there gets you over your fear people will be nice to you mostly um then there's another one that people a lot of people like if they're if the honest approach is not um is not their cup of tea because it's too bold uh which is called the fade in you'll see people doing this if you look around um at a party um it's where people you sort of sidle up to a group and you kind of edge in very slowly so that people don't really notice you're coming in <laughs> And then, and you have to listen really hard. This is the key to the fade in. You have to listen really hard. And then, um, when you, when somebody says something that you have something really relevant to say, you can just j jump in. Like, you know, if somebody's talking about a movie, then, and they're, they've gotten to the, you know, a certain scene and you've seen that movie, you can say, yeah. And when he leapt over the wall, blah, blah, blah. And people will, it's like as if you've been there all along. People will just, Mostly people will just open up a little bit, let you, let you be in there and it's, and you're in, um, you can't, the warning with the fade in is you can't, um, hang around the peripheral for too long without <laughs> joining in. Uh, <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing there? <laughs> I mean, the, but the good thing is if you, if you, with the fade in reproach, if you're, if you're standing there and you're listening to people and it seems like it's not going to be easy for you to join this group. You can pretty much abort and sort of gently fade out <laughs> if you if it hasn't been too much time. All right. <laughs> then there's someone I really li something I really like, which is probably a little easier for women, um, but not necessarily. It's just a, these different styles of it. It's called the flattery entree. The flattery entree is when you um, comment on someone's accessory. Now there are warnings to this. It should be something that's above the neck. Um, for obvious reasons, you know, and especially in this day and age, um, you don't want to offend anybody. But um, usually I like to use earrings. Um, with men, you can use ties, you know, glasses, you know, or earrings. Um, anything that is, um, that is not too personal. You don't want to use, a, you don't want to comment on a woman's dress or their shoes or anything like that. But although... Women to women, you could, and if a person has fabulous shoes on, you could probably do that. But it's better, best to stay above the neck. And what that does is, it's not only does it, it, it's a positive thing. You're immediately making someone feel good, which is a, always a good way to start. And you're also introducing a subject because if you say, "I, hi, where those are fabulous earrings. Where did you get them?" All you know, you've got a subject already that she'll say where she got the earrings, and then you're in. Maybe it was a trip to Mexico or Texco or something, yes. and then. You know, exactly. Like, oh. Oftentimes, I um, uh, that's that can be a good thing to do. You know, you can use the flattery entree as not an entree too. You can use it for recovering from a faux pas or changing the subject or whatever. It's 
very, it's very, it's a good, good thing to try and, um, even when you're nervous to try to observe and see what people are wearing. And lots of times people these days have fabulous glasses that you can comment on. Um, and then the last entrance maneuver, uh, is the sophistication test. That's one of my favorites, by the way. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I will confess that I sort of stole this book, this technique, or I altered it from a series of, um, a series of novels I read when I was 13 um, that were about a debutante in mainline Philadelphia. And her, the main character, Maudie, was this person. I think I probably, you know, she taught me how to mingle this main character of these books. She was filled with witty lines. And um, she, she had an open, and, uh, and when the men would come to dance with her, she would use what she called the sophistication test. So I stole it from this old no- novel from 1929. But um, what it is is you you say something that um, not only is an opening line but is a good test for what what kind of person it is and what kind of conversation you can expect to have. Um, like uh, I think one of them is how do you fit into this picture? You know, something that's a little bit abstract so that people's answer they can either answer literally or they can answer with something clever and then you know that you're you know going to be on a certain level. I think some of them are like a, another example of a sophistication test is, uh, so, uh, you know, what's your story or, you know, how's it going or, um, you know, what's your role in all this, this scene or something like that. Something that fits your personality, but like something that people can answer in different ways. Yeah. I, I particularly like that one, the what's your story, because some people will be like, oh, like, what do you mean? You know, and and then like, okay, you're going to be a boring person to talk to. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, because especially when you say, what's your story? Obviously, you have to say it with a smile. You can't say, yeah. what's your story? Yeah. <laughs> but when you say, what's your story? Um, people will be, most people will say, well, you know, uh, I'm here because the host and I went to college together. Or they'll say, um, I'm, you know, uh, look, I'm, I'm just new to New York or something. And some people will say, you know, it will be much more, you know, creative and, and interesting, right? Where they'll right. be like, well, you know, if you really want a five point narrative arc to the story, well, right. well you know, let me. Or somebody st- can say, if you said you can say, what's your story? And somebody could say, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. You never know. Yeah. It, it, um, it all started when I was trying to hail a cab. Like, oh, yeah. You know, right, you know, exactly. Oh, okay. The person's going to have some. So, yeah, you can get give people a chance to. To you know, then it's, it's like if people want to um, stay. So a lot of people when they're mingling don't want to give personal information. They just rather, you know, be playful, and then you, it allows them to do that. So one, um, um, and then there's one that I love. Which, which I'm not sure which one it's called. It's uh, it's uh, doing some kind of hey, I need your help. I am doing a survey tonight, or I'm trying to find out. You know, um, I'm asking people what they think about X, Y, Z. Oh yeah, poll, poll taking. There's a. I think that's in the chapter on. Um, on getting keeping the conversation going. Okay. It's it's either called um, I poll taking or pl- game playing a game. I think it's playing a game. All right. Um, and because there are various ways you can play a game, you can say, um, "What color do you think this is?" If you're wearing a shirt that's like reddish, reddish, reddish pink or something, or you can say, um, "You know, I'm taking a poll. How many people have seen this movie? I'm taking a poll, or you know, ha- tell me, um, I'm." Doing a survey, how many people here um, have a regional accent? I mean, you could do a lot of different kinds, but that that comes. That's really kind of later, um, I think. Uh, or is it? There is there is one opening line I think that is similar to that. You know, I always tell people I wrote this book, but I didn't memorize it. <laughs> <laughs> that might be your your level two playful. Um, oh yeah, you know. that's right. I have the I have opening lines, yeah. um, and I do have a list of opening lines, and they range from the really safe ones um, to the ones that are more, that are more fun. And so that can be, you know, that can be for, for various different people. I guess it's true. The level two, um, that is like a level two, like a playful line. I particularly like the one is this, hello, I'm practicing my mingling tonight. How am I doing? <laughs> <That's>... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, I actually use that one a lot. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and then there's also the one I, of like, the playful one that I like um, is um, uh, I, I don't mean to interrupt. Well, okay, I guess I do. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, so you know, hopefully you can get people that will respond to that. They're, the risk-free ones are pretty obvious. You know, how do you know the host? Um, and, you know, isn't the food great and like that? And then, yeah. then there are the level three ones, the daring ones. And, you know, you're, I love, love your point, which uh, about how if you come with a specific purpose in mind, you're li- like, you know, romantic or business, you're, you're likely not to achieve it. But if you come to be playful, you might actually be more successful in achieving one of those. Right. Sort of real, You'll notice that if yeah. you look at the people in life who are the most successful and you watch the way they are at parties, um, you, I think you'll be able to tell, see this in people. Like the people who really put the fun and connecting with people first and, and, and not what they're trying to do, put, that, put all those secondary goals. Second, um, they, it, it does work better because people can sense it, you know, and it makes everybody more relaxed when they can see that you're not really after anything. You don't have anything in mind. Like, who are you? Yeah. You know? Like, okay, you're not important. Let me move on. So you break into the group. Now, how do we get the conversation? How do we keep the conversation going? What are, what are some tips you have? Well, one thing is um, you don't want to the one thing you don't want to do is, is immediately ask somebody, like I just said, what they do. Oh, so this boring. is a thing that people, it's a really common mistake because it's an easy, it seems like the right thing to do because you're asking about the other person, which is, you know, good, not talking about yourself. But if you've just said hello and that's all and, you know, not hadn't, hadn't had any, doesn't, haven't had any other conversation really, and you immediately ask somebody what they do for a living, you, it could, you could get into trouble that way because you don't know what subject you're bringing up, basically. And the person could have been fired. The person could have um, a job that you find either really boring or really um, really offensive or disgusting or something. <laughs> I mean, that's not usual. Most of the time, it's just something that you don't really want to talk about. But it's often, um, you know, they might not, maybe they, maybe they don't want to talk about their career because something bad's going on. So um, it also, it smacks of you're trying to, it makes it seem like you're trying to figure out if they're worth your time. So you, you want to wait until you're in a conversation for several more minutes before you, you know, and or get, make it organic, you know, that you, you bring up what people do. Um, and then there's various different <laughs> tricks for when offered, when, you know, when um, awkward, com- uh, awkward silences come. There's, uh, you know, there's the interview technique, uh, which is to just keep ask people questions. Um, and, you know, that usually works, but it, it's also a good, good idea. And ideally, you want to try to have as much give back. You want to talk as much as you ask questions. So when you're doing the interview, for example, what I call the quote, you know, interview technique, um, you should coach your questions in with an in offering information. Like, for example, instead of saying um, how how long have you you know how long have you lived in the city, you can say something like. I've been in the city since 1985. I can't believe how long I've lived here. It feels like yesterday I moved here. How long have you lived here? So you want to give information so that it inspires them to respond not only to your question, but to also what you're saying. Do you know what I mean? Sure. And maybe don't ask a close-ended question, but make it open. Like what, what changes have you seen since you've been living here? You know, right, more exactly. More open-ended, right? Right. Um, you know, what's your favorite what's your favorite restaurant, what kinds of things, you know, whatever that you can, it'll become natural, but, um, that's one thing. And then as, then, as I mentioned before, there's another one I like to use called playing a game, which is, you know, what color would you say this is? What is that you're drinking? No, let me guess what you're drinking. Let me guess what you're drinking. Um, you know, uh, tell me one thing about your company and I'll, I'll tell you what company it is. That's a hard one. I don't think I could do that one, actually, but some people might be able to, depending upon the party. Um, there's other ones I list in the book that are examples of things that you can do. Uh, and then <clears throat> there's a room with a view. Uh, this is also um, fairly obvious, but it's a good thing to remember, um, which is that um, sometimes people don't really want to be immediately asked questions, and the better way to bond is to make observations about what's going on. So, you know, see that woman over by the door. Uh, do you know who that is? You know, or isn't, you know, isn't the host's um, son tall now? Or, you know, v- various things. The, have you ever seen such a big plate of salmon? I don't know. Um, just, you know, so that you can get, you can both talk about what you're both experiencing. 
Right. Like, I mean, salmon, if there's salmon there, it could be, I can't imagine what a small plate of salmon they gave us or, <laughs> or big salmon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it can go either way. I mean, if there's salmon, you have your line ready to go. <laughs> um, so probably the, this is probably the, the easier part, right? Like getting, like once you've broken in, you know, people, you know, learn how to learn how to talk they, you know, so let's say people are getting through the conversation. The tough part though, is how do you break out? So what are some tips that you share for getting out of that click so you can move on and find out other people to have fun with? Right. Um, that is really important. I've had many people, um, say that the one reason that they don't, it's not that they're afraid of talking to strangers. It's they're, that they're afraid they can't get away from strangers. <laughs> so they really don't want to get stuck talking to someone. It's like their idea of hell. So, um, which is why I put a whole chapter in the book on escaping. Um, and the idea, of course, is escaping without hurting anyone's feelings. That's key. Anybody can walk away, you know, from someone at the, you know, just walk away from a conversation. But, you know, it, the, we are trying to learn how to be nicer to each other. And, and in, a, in a civilized society, we should not be hurting anybody's feelings at a party. So um, <clears throat> the, one of the, the most obvious escape technique I have, a, I have about 12 in the book, I think, but the most obvious one is the, what I call the buffet bye-bye and other handy excuses, which is, um, this has been really lovely to talk to you, but I, I really need to go get another drink. I need to use the restroom. But the best one, the, most, the safest one of, that, of those is the telephone. Even in the day of iPhones, <clears throat> uh, people know that you can't just take a phone call in the middle of a conversation. So you can say, I have to, uh, I have to check in with somebody. I have to take a phone call. I have to make a phone call. Please excuse me. Then of course you really do have to, you can't then just walk away to another group of people. <laughs> just walk over to the next yeah. group. You have to at least move over to a corner of the room, look at your phone, pretend to even, at least try to call somebody before you go talk to someone else. But that one works pretty well. Um, and then one of my other favorite escape techniques, which everyone seems to love hearing about, it sounds so mean, but it's, actually quite um, used quite often. It's just that I have a mean name for it. It's called the human sacrifice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the human sacrifice is when the, the, what you, you need for this, though, you need to know at least one, a couple other people at the party because you need to be able to, you're sp sitting there and the boorest, the boorest, boring person is talking to you and you see somebody coming by and you, that you know, and you grab that person <laughs> and you, you introduce them to the person you're talking to and as soon as they, their eyes meet and they say hello, <laughs> you take off. You can leave. You can leave there. It's sort of like getting them another dance partner. And the, if you don't, you have to do it right away, or it's awkward. But if 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 you in ten seconds you can within ten seconds get you can leave after you introduce them to another person. And of course, the other person you know will soon realize that you may may or may not realize that you've done this. You use them <laughs> for a human sacrifice. But you know, all share in love and mingling, and you can. <laughs> They can use their, they can sacrifice with somebody else. And also, you know, another one other, one person's treasure is another person's trash. So, you know, that person, they could get along fine. Sure. The I mean, two new people. Hey, we've all probably been that human sacrifice at some point. Right? Everybody's <laughs> done that. Everybody's. And the, especially, um, the thing is, uh, if you're, if you've got a really good host, uh, they may, and, 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 and there's a person at the party who's not just, you know, I mean, it's terrible to say boring. It's just a shorthand way of saying, uh, because everybody, you know, people have different tastes, but there could be somebody who's obnoxious or drunk at the party that you're trying to escape from, in which case the host should be helping you. Like if they know there's somebody at that party, they should be watching and rescuing that person, um, as much as possible. But anyway, that's another chapter. Um, another, um, there's also, um, uh, subject changing techniques in the, uh, escape chapter, um, where, which is, they're complicated to talk about, but where you, I, I outline how you can actually, how you change the subject effectively and then leave. Um, there's the counterfeit search, which is, um, where you pretend you're, you're, you have to, you know, you say, I'm so sorry, excuse me, I know this sounds rude, but my boss told me I had to talk to this particular person, and I think they just walked in the door um, like that. Um, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, you can escape by mutual consent, which is when you realize that both of you have just, you know, the conversation has come to its natural conclusion. Um, that sometimes happens. That's like, you know, it's sort of like when 
old people die in their sleep. You always hope for that. It doesn't happen there often. <laughs> or you can do, I think somewhere in there you offer the one of like saying like, hey, my wife told me I had to come here and mingle, so I guess we better go do it. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, so I think we're supposed to mingle at this thing. Uh, so let's... <laughs> Yeah, exactly. yeah and, and there's also the there's the um the shake and break is my favorite. shake and break <laughs> you're probably not old enough to remember this there was a commercial way back in when i was a tiny kid that was called shake and bake sure i know shake and bake oh, you yeah, know that? yeah okay. I'm, uh, anyway um so that's the, yeah that you just basically <laughs> stick your hand out until the person has to stop talking and you shake their hand and then you just it's been so nice talking to you <laughs> and then you break. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like just left stunned. Like, uh, uh, okay. Uh, right. Shake and break. So that's sort of a emer- an emergency break glass and shake shake and break. Yeah. And that is, that is very cool. Um, so, um, and there's, of course, there's the fade out, um, which is the opposite of the fade in. Yeah. Well, you can, can't do that when you're talking to one person. No, it's tough. <laughs> but if you're talking with a, in a larger group and you want to leave, you can kind of, just start to edge your way out, you know, they're still talking, they're still talking, and you're gone. What are some of the benefits that readers have told you they've gained from improving their mingling game? Um, most people, you know, I've had a lot of letters from people who, frankly, who um, they range from what you said, which is that they just enjoy their social life so much more. But I've had people, I've had letters from people who met their mates because of my book. I mean, they, that's what they say that, you know, they would never have talked to this person at the party if it weren't for, um, you know, getting, learning these basic techniques. It sounds so, um, silly or corny sometimes because, you know, you need a book to like talk to people, but you know, people, well, you wrote not, the book. I mean, I know, really, but I mean, it's not people, people used to know this stuff, I think more in the Victorian age, for example, where people were just trained, mm, but mm. even then, you know, I've, I've seen those, those, um, Jane Austen movies. There's still people that were shy that even back then when conversation was an art form. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, shyness might be partly like truly, I don't know, genetic or something, but maybe it's also partly just, we're never trained on how to do it. And, uh, Right. You know, so like if you and actually It is this, amazing. Yeah. Like I've been on um you know TV shows like where I was on the, for the first time the when the book was first, first published I was on with the Today show with Katie Couric and um she mentioned that she had minglephobia. Wow. And like she loved my book. And so that that's when I realized okay. This is wider spread disease minglephobia than I ever <laughs> than I ever imagined. These famous celebrities have it. Yeah, it's it's not a skill set that's taught in school. Um, let's talk to me a little bit about, you've got a whole raft of other books as well. So you got the faux pas survival guide, getting, right. getting beyond hello, come ons, come backs and kiss offs, artful dodging, truer than true romance, life is friends, etiquette for the end of the world. So you have this whole range, you have this program, uh, and, uh, how, tell me a little bit about how that's come about this, uh. Well, when the, the Art of Mingling was first published, that was my first book, and since it was, it had, it did make, um, it was success, very successful, and so of course my, you know, my publisher obviously wanted me to do more of them. I didn't, you know, when I first wrote the Art of Mingling, I didn't think this was going to be my life. I just wrote it because, you know, it came from the cocktail napkin, and <laughs> I thought I know something about this, and I can be sort of amusing about it as well as helpful. And then it kind of just grew into a little bit of a mini industry because. Um, you know, it turned out that that I had information that people needed. So I ended up, you know, publishing a lot of these. Um, and along the way, I've written some, some you know, some um, articles on the subject and given some workshops and done some talks and, uh, you know, and I'm working on a new book um, that is um, not been, that is just about to be bought by a publisher. And, um, it's going to be. It's going to have to do with um, how to deal with your social life in this day and age when everybody is so contentious and divided. Hmm. That is certainly the case. Don't bring up politics at a cocktail party unless you want to. You know, right. And there's a, in the art of mingling. There's a little section in, um, uh, about how to talk politics um, at a party, um, and 
in general, there are there 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 are strategies for how to talk politics without arguing. Mm. It's a very difficult thing to do because you know usually you think well you either have to just not talk about it at all uh, or you know it's going to be a fight. But there are some ways in which one can carefully you know and then you can have interesting conversations as long as you you know there's a there's strategies on how to test for if you're talking to a fanatic um, on either side. Mm. Like even if you're on one political side. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to argue if you're with somebody who's on the same – if you're left-wing and you're talking to someone who's left-wing um, or liberal. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean you won't argue because they could still be fanatical about something in a way that pushes your buttons. So there are all there are different ways that you can – like I do touch on it in The Art of Mingling that you can um, figure out how to, how to avoid arguing. You don't want to argue at a cocktail party. You know, that's the thing. It's like, you know, you can – you can you can be an activist and um, you know spend the rest of your life working towards your cause, but when you're in that Sunday brunch, that's not the place to do it. Yeah, you're prob- you're <laughs> that's probably my, that's not. This mingles instructions. You're probably not going to convince anyone. How do you go about researching a book like Etiquette for the End of the World or the Faux Pas Survival Guide? <laughs> well, the the Faux Pas Survival Guide was a fun one to research because basically what I did for you know nine months or a year is just ask every single person I ever met, you know, on a plane, um, my life at a parties, you know, just everywhere. And then, of course, I did read, you know, I, re- I would read about faux pas that people may, you know, that people were talking about it, various funny articles or whatever. But mostly I just asked everybody in the world, like, what kind of faux pas they made and what their worst situations were. And um, I'm thinking about revising that book um, and updating it and publishing it under, under its original title, which was, how to hold your head high with your foot in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I just, I just love talking about social life. I love, I love watching it. I love, I love going to a party and, um, and sort of analyzing afterwards what happened. Cause I'm just so fascinated by this, this uh, particular part of human behavior and interaction. The etiquette for the end of the world, by the way, was, is actually a novel. Uh, it was my one, there are two books on my list that are not in the same, they're not humor self-help books like all my other ones. And The Etiquette for the End of the World was my um, my first novel. It has some, you know, self-help buried in there, but mostly it's a humorous, like a romantic comedy. And then Truer Than True Romance was um, just straight up, you know, satire humor, really fun to do. Awesome. The one area that I did want to circle back on in um, about mingling is around kind of business mingling. You have some tips in there about uh, about business cards. Want to share some of those? About what? I'm sorry. About business cards. When when to share? Oh them. yeah, business cards. Yeah, when to share them. When to uh, you know whether to make right. notes yeah, on that's, them. That's good. I mean, not everybody has business cards anymore, but um, most people still do. Yeah. And um, what what my, what I say is that. Um, I don't think that you should offer your business card unless somebody asks you for it. You don't ask for the other person's business card. You offer your own business card, and you do that when you're at the end of the conversation and it's winding down, not when you're in the middle, mostly. I mean, unless it's like there's some times when you're talking where it's really appropriate. You're talking about a specific thing, and they, you know, you might, and any time they ask for your card, you give it to them. But when you're offering your card, it should probably be at the end. And, um, Never ask for the other person's business card because the other person may not want to give you their card and you're putting them in a spot um, where they have to make up something like, I'm sorry, I really didn't bring any or I've only brought a few or I don't know. But you, you offer your card, but you never ask for theirs. Mm. Oh, interesting. I, I, okay. So uh, you, you can ask someone to pass the salt, but don't ask them to pass you their business card because then they may not want you to call them actually. Um, but if you offer yours... So hey, I'd yeah, love they'll to... usually they'll they'll either say thank you and then but then they can call you, right? Or they'll offer their their card. But your the, the actual act of you asking of you offering your card sure is enough, and it's too pushy to then ask for theirs. Okay, yeah, that's my opinion. I'd love to stay in touch. Here's my card, um, you know, and then if they want to offer theirs, great. Yeah, one thing that I, that people do now, which I I have to say, and it may just be because I'm old fashioned, so I say this with a. I'm offering this with a grain of salt or whatever, um, is people, I've noticed that parties people will say, let me have your phone, I'll put my information in it. Mm. I, don't, I think that's very, very um, intrusive. Um, it's one thing, you know, again, if, you, if, 
if 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 you offer your phone to somebody I don't know. I just don't like the whole thing. I don't. I like. I don't think it's too much work for in the middle of a party for um, first of all for somebody to like start doing that. I just don't like that. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. It's it's like let me have your wallet and I'll you know. It's kind of like too. Yeah, like hand, handing your phone over to somebody. It's just like it's a people, especially. They, I think it's this. Um, you know the the um, younger generation just is used to doing that. So, but I, I don't advise it uh, unless you're. You know, at a party with like, I guess there's some kinds of parties, parties where it's all like super good friends and, you know, I don't know, but I, I, I wouldn't recommend that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, uh, name tag tips. Name tag. Um, the, the people, I used to be against name tags cause I thought it was, they were so, um, I don't know, uh, like why not just say what your name is? But I think they really are very helpful. One of the things is you when when you're at a party where there's name tags. First of all, I don't you, I don't wear the ones that have pins in them. I won't put that on because I don't feel like anybody should have to ruin their clothing on, for the sake of new name tags. But I will try to I will pin it to my like purse strap or something. But um, when people when you're at a party with name tags, it's important to not be obvious about circulating and trying to read people's name tags before you talk to them. You don't want to get caught like looking like you're just checking out who they are before you're going to talk to them. Like, you know, wait, you're nobody, you're nobody, you're nobody. Oh, here's somebody I want to talk to. So try not to look at their name tag until you actually are going to go up to talk to them. Um, there are some people who like to get cute with name tags. Um, and write silly things on them. And I think there are some parties that's appropriate for, uh, like punctuation, fun punctuation, like your name and a question mark. <laughs> if you're at a playful kind of party, you know, like a reunion. But business parties, I wouldn't do that. Um, and um, I'm thinking, let's see, what else? Uh, you can, I mean, like I said, I, I sometimes wear my name tag not, not on my chest. Um, but like on my purse or, um, somewhere more interesting, um, because for one thing, or at least pretty high up on my chest, I just don't know. I don't know. I just feel like it's, it's, it's fun to do it, wear it in an interesting place. Um, you can write, you know, you can write, if you want to be playful, you can write something else besides your name, you know, um, like guess who <laughs> or something. Um, but you know, you have to sort of feel out where, where you are for that. Yeah, or Miss Mingle. Um, yeah. Gene, where can listeners find out more about you and maybe sign up on your email list so they can find out when your newest book comes out and, and any other news about you? What's the best um, place they for them can, to go? They can go to my website, which is um, jeanmartinet.com. That's J-E-A-N-N-E-M-A-R-T-I-N-E-T.com. And there they can, my, my, um, e my email address is on there and they should email me directly. I have a blog there and um, all my books, um, information about my books and anything that's happening um, media-wise will be on there. Well, awesome. So check it out. I have uh, signed up there and I got to say, this has been such a thrill for me. Um, for me, it's like having a you know hero of mine on the show. Uh, I you changed that's so, you, that's so that's so great. Will. Yeah. I'm so glad that you, makes me feel so good. You changed my uh, my social interactions. I you know it's still it still feels a little bit like it takes energy. You know, I'm an eye it takes energy, but it's uh, but it's fun. And uh -huh. I used to just kind of stand in the corner and not know like how to do it. And you, you basically kind of have a you know, a roadmap. I have a set of how-to instructions. I'm so happy to hear that because, for one thing, um, sometimes people um, like my book is very, is playful, and um, even though I have some techniques in it where you're not technically telling the truth, which some people really take exception to, it's all you know, it's all a fun. It's all in the name of fun and connection. Yeah, and also realizing that most other people at the party probably are all just as much of a mingle phobe as I am. So they, yes. so they're just as thrilled when you break into their group and lighten things up for them. That is true. That's one of the five laws of survival, that everybody there feels, almost everybody there feels exactly the same way as you. That's right. Gene, such a pleasure speaking with you. Awesome book. I'm looking forward to the next one. Thank you for coming on the show. 
Thank you so much, Will. Mingle on. <laughs> right. Mingle on. <laughs> bye bye, Gene. <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Unleashed, the show that explores how to thrive as an independent professional. Unleashed is sponsored by Umbrex, the world's first global community of top-tier independent management consultants. The mission of Umbrex is to create opportunities for independent management consultants to meet, share lessons learned, and collaborate. I'd love to get your feedback and hear any questions that you'd like to see us answer on this show. You can email me at unleashed at umbrex.com. That's U-M-B-R-E-X dot com. If you found anything on the show helpful, it would be a real gift if you would let a friend know about the show and take a minute to leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. And if you subscribe, our show will get delivered to your device every Monday. Our audio engineer is Dave Nelson. Our theme song was composed by Gary Negbauer, and I'm your host, Will Bachman. Thanks for listening.